Good morning, everyone. Hope everyone had a great night last night. Um, that show was absolutely amazing. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, so a few little housekeeping things we'll kind of get through as well. So we on the right hand side, for those that are not familiar with the platform, we have a little chat window there and Q&A window as well. So if you do have questions for any of our speakers today, you can just ask them within that platform. And you can also uh, move around after the, the presentations and we'll be sharing a link in that chat window so to take you out of the out of the um, the room. Now our next speaker I was just chatting to before so he comes from all the way from Chicago in the US and we are, are very fortunate and he's very fortunate that's normal time you know or reasonable time for him so it's only you know in the afternoon or late afternoon for him so it's not three in the morning which is quite quite lovely. Um, so we have John Bambanek who's going to be presenting. So he's a president of Bambanek Consulting. He's also a PhD student at the University of Illinois and also a handler with the SANS Internet Storm Center. And I would say he's probably a very, very busy person with a lot of spare time. <laughs> he has over 20 years experience in information security and leads several interna international investigative efforts tracking cyber criminals, some of which have led to some very high profile arrests and illegal action, which is a very positive thing to, to see. He currently tracks neo-Nazi fundraising via cryptocurrency and publishes that online to Twitter and has other monitoring solutions for cryptocurrency activity. So first and foremost, thank you very much, John, for being one of our heroes of the internet. So he's going to be talking around adversarial machine learning and its impacts on uh, cyber security. So without further ado, thank you very much, John. Thank you. Uh, I'll uh, share my screen here really quick. All right, well, it's going to be a little meta here for a second so I can find where my PowerPoint is. There we go. All right. Um, so today, uh, or this evening for me, but today for you, uh, I'm going to talk about adversarial machine learning. I uh, already went over my bio a little bit, uh, but uh, um, I've recently uh, gone back to get my PhD in machine learning um, uh, in what I call multi-domain uh, cybersecurity machine learning. So using the context of um, activity as it relates to each other uh, to come to some better uh, decision making in some of the machine learning models that we have. And there's aspects of that that I'll talk about this, specifically how the criminals try to abuse machine learning to obviously create bad classifications and bad outcomes. So generally, the state of the problem in cybersecurity, right? This is a tongue-in-cheek uh, Onion article, uh, which is a, a parody news site. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with from, from five years ago, but it still holds true. The, the vulnerable attack surface uh, of, 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 of many of our countries is so huge that even the criminals are having uh, a hard time uh, keeping up with it. So we have a whole lot of problem and not enough people trying to solve it. Uh, and one way that we try to, that, that has been advertised to address the cybersecurity problem is to try to automate uh, just security automation generally. Right? If we can have computers automate uh, so many tasks, less people will be needed to secure things, which sounds good uh, with some caveats. A part of that, of course, is, is machine learning, right? Machine learning is one form of automation. Uh, and with, as with everything of technology, there's an XKCD that kind of makes fun of some, fun of some things, but there's an element of truth, you know, is, a lot of machine learning is people taking data, putting it into a pile, running uh, linear mathematical algorithms over there and seeing what comes out of it and, and, and the clusters. And they don't, a lot of people don't spend any real time asking fundamental questions of where the data comes from, you know, what kind of classifications there are and what is outputted for the system. A lot of machine learning research and discussion and tools focuses a lot about on the algorithms that do linear algebra. And that's all very interesting and complicated if you're a mathematician. But by and large, the algorithms just work, right? You, you can trust the algorithm to do its job, most much like anything you program a computer to do, right? It, it will do exactly what you tell it to do. 
The problem is if you put garbage in, you get garbage out. And we're going to talk about one aspect of that is, is, is adversarial behavior. So there's a handful of machine learning use cases. Uh, people are doing it for ad tracking and related behaviors to uh, find based on these attributes of what websites you go to and how you post on Facebook and who you interact with on, on Twitter, what kind of product should I advertise to you? There's image classification, object recognition, right? If I'm a self-driving car, I need to know what's going on around me to uh, avoid accidents. Or facial recognition systems that are not just used in social media, but used by law enforcement, which is its own human rights concern, right? And, and, and quite frankly, a lot of machine learning use cases are creating human rights issues uh, in ways that aren't anticipated that many of us will have to start dealing with here uh, in the near term. Uh, but this, this talk is specifically about cyber security machine learning. There's also a conversation about machine uh, um, cyber security in machine learning. Uh, that's its own topic that deals in with human rights. Uh, there's natural language processing, uh, but specifically we're going to talk about the last one of security automation. Right? It could be something as rudimentary as, is this file malware or malicious? Is this domain uh, uh, bad? Is this set of network traffic uh, something that should be blocked or interdicted? Uh, how do I process uh, you know, uh, a seam and data and, and all that data in a seam to bubble up to the surface of stuff that really needs to be responded to? There's a handful of, of products out there in the open source world. Um, there is uh, DGA detection, right? There's lots of open source products and researches that will help you detect whether a given input domain is generated by a domain generation algorithm. Uh, phishing, right, is something a phishing email or a phishing web page, right? Some of that uses natural language processing. Some of that uses image recognition, right? Is this PayPal, is this a PayPal logo on this, on this page that isn't on a PayPal property? Uh, and there's some on ransomware. There are some commercial products that advertise machine learning functionality uh, with endpoint uh, products, uh, you know, seam based analysis and network traffic and attack service monitoring and, and threat and vulnerability analysis. There's lots of ways that uh, people are trying to deploy machine learning to figure out what really matters in terms of threats in, in the network. Um, and those exist and are deployed today. Uh, that whether those technologies are all that they're uh, made out to be is another question. But why machine learning, right? I mean, there's several several reasons, right? Is um, I don't know the technical breakdown, but having been to an OSERT conference before, uh, I don't know. You know, there's there are reverse engineers there at this this conference who who handle malware. There's SOC analysts. There are people who you know are doing compliance. The wide gamut of cybersecurity, and all all you all know that responding to an incident and recognizing an incident takes time and it takes analysis. Uh, human beings make mistakes. I mean, phishing inherently is really, you know, at its core, human beings making mistakes. But even, even us who have been in this industry for a long time have, have made mistakes. We don't pay attention to detail. We miss important things. Uh, some of those things are, they make it very easy to miss with, with puny code and the internationalization of domain names, right? The letter O, there's like 22 versions of the letter O. So when I type Microsoft.com or when I see Microsoft.com in a link, is it really going to Redmond, Washington? Or is that O something different where it's a phishing web pages? And human beings are not consistent. We get tired. We have biases. We make mistakes. You know, we could be operating under stress and having to make quick decisions. Computers, you know, do things quickly, you know, and they're not subject to the human stresses and psychological impacts that we are. But does machine learning really fix this? Yeah, I mean, computers do things at scale very fast, you know, um, and machine learning can operate fast. Sometimes it's a little slower depending on how much, uh, how much you're, you're trying to process, but the cluster data. But the fundamental problem of machine learning is not the math. In fact, the fundamental problem of any computer flaw is not the code, it's the human being creating the system, in the case of machine learning, picking the features, right, of what attributes am I analyzing, choosing the training data, the training set of what data do I, do I start with in analyzing, you know, how am I operating in, in what context, am I operating in an internal system, operating on a scene, am I operating on the internet at large, 
and there's a human being evaluating the results. And these are where the errors come in, despite a lot of the research being focused on the math uh, by mathematicians, which means you know, there's lots of the problem space that's underanalyzed and underconsidered from uh, a, risk port, uh, a risk perspective that if you're deploying these things, you know, even outside the cybersecurity context, if you're doing fraud detection, right? Is, is are people really looking at all, all of the human decisions in there to ensure that there's not errors, right? The, the cynical answer to that is machine learning makes human mistakes at machine speed, right? Because it's very easy to make mistakes in those above four in, if those mistakes are not caught. You're, that mistake is just being multiplied at scale of, of whatever the, the context of that system in there. So the domain of adversarial machine learning begins with, with training data, right? It's if I can give inputs to this machine learning algorithm, and ultimately I can, right, either in the training data uh, or in, in its processing, how can I manipulate that system to make incorrect decisions, right? Up front, right, there's poisoning the trade and training data, um, you know, but certainly just the data in general that it's processed on, right? And, and this third point here seems subtle and, self, you know, and kind of self-explanatory, but it's really the most profound problem. For machine learning, generally, your training data starts with benign things. You know, Facebook has algorithms to say, oh, you like this artist and you're posting about this news and it can kind of figure out what you're interested in to basically sell targeted advertising uh, access to advertisers. OK, but by and large, all the data that's being analyzed is is generally benign. Right. It's, you know, how I'm po most people are posting on Facebook not to manipulate the algorithms. Uh, people are doing image recognition based on Google Images. They type in cat and they select, okay, here are all the cat pictures. Um, if you're doing natural language processing, you're operating on literature or news articles, right? And, and one particularly interesting thing is there are machine learning systems out there that are analyzing news, news sites now, particularly business news, to do high-frequency trading. Oh, this news article or this social media post is good news for this company I should buy, or it's bad news and I should sell, or do options trading and the like. Uh, you know, we're, we're deploying a lot of these things. And when you train them, and you starting with good data, and that's fine, right? In cybersecurity, what we have is malicious data. We actually don't have a lot of good, good data sets, right? So if you think about it, you know, I want to create a machine learning tool to, to determine if something's malware or not. You've got lots of malware. You can go to virus total and get it. How do you find benign uh, executables? Well, you could start with Windows and maybe Office and web browsers. Uh, but going to all of the third party tools, even conventional ones, is hard. And I'm sure many of you who have ever been responsible for antivirus systems in an enterprise know that, I don't know, once a year or so, a major antivirus product detects you know some major dll or executable like word as malicious uh, major antivirus companies get it wrong every now and then you've got malicious network traffic you've got phishing emails all of this is created by the adversary who has decades of experience tricking our systems in automated ways and we're going to talk about how they do that uh, in this talk right um, so that's the profound difference is that we're starting operating on not just malicious stuff, but malicious uh, data sets where the adversary is actively trying to manipulate information systems. So let's give an example of poisoning the data set, right? Of poisoning your training data set. So of just domain names. We've talked about domain generation algorithms, right? Mathematical uh, formulas that take input that just produce random looking domain names. Well, if you were going to create a whitelist, what would you do, right? You'd go to Majestic or Umbrella or Alexa uh, that creates lists of the most popular domains on the internet, right? Up to a million. Uh, and that's what everybody uses as whitelists. If you take a look at domain whitelists in scholar.google, you're going to see lots of research into that. Well, that can't be manipulated, right? 
you know, it's the most popular stuff, right? The top 10 is pretty static. It's YouTube and Facebook and Apple and Amazon, things you would expect, right? But you get much farther down that list and, and things do get manipulated, right? And not necessarily with, with what you would consider machine, er, machine learning attack tools, right? There's black hat search engine optimization, right? There's an entire cottage industry and, and we call it black hat SEO, but we really don't treat it as a criminal marketplace, right? Is, is Google and the search engines try to figure out algorithms to stop it, but by and large, there are people who do nothing all day, who've made lots of money that make sure their client's websites are the top of whatever targeted Google searches or Bing or DuckDuckGo or whatever, right? The social media amplification, right? That's a huge threat. We'll talk about that specifically uh, in a little bit, but almost all of the activity around election manipulation is, is based off of disinformation in social media. And you know, it's not just one person posting to Twitter or Facebook. You've got to get you've got to get that information out there. There are traffic delivery systems uh, to make websites artificially more popular. It's done with click fraud or uh, uh, click fraud type networks. Uh, it's also done in exploit uh, exploit kits. It already exists. It exists before there was a notion of using cybersecurity machine learning. But the fundamental point is criminals have been exploiting automated systems forever, right? Is the fundamental computer security problem that we're all addressing is that we have information systems that are processing inputs that we can't trust. And how do you do that safely, right? Whether that's buffer overflows or SQL injection, uh, the list goes on, but ultimately comes down to it's easy to create untrusted inputs and it's hard to create systems that will safely process them. That problem did not go away in machine learning. It's just a lot of people just pretend that it doesn't exist because the algorithms don't lie. Well, the problem isn't the algorithms, it's the four aspects I showed earlier. And if I can poison the upfront training set because people use whitelists that are based on popularity, which is a rough analogy of safe, but not complete. If I can manipulate that, then all of a sudden my attacks get whitelisted and I'm through, right? And I, I defeat the machine learning system. So when you talk about adversarial machine learning and research uh, and see the academic literature, you're talking about, uh, you know, generative, uh, generated samples where here I get a panda and I apply some very uh, subtle noise to the image, um, you know, uh, that is imperceptible to the human eye. So when a machine learning image looks at this panda over here, it, it doesn't see a panda, it sees a gibbon, even though in my human eye, I'm looking at it and I see what it is. Because unlike humans that ignore immense amounts of information, computers see it and process all of it. That's how research does it. Those are how people who are generating the attacks uh, against machine learning systems are trying to test it, right? In these obscure mathematical ways, right? And I'm using image classification to make a point. Well, if you were trying to trick a facial recognition system, first, a facial recognition system isn't operating off of static images, it's operating off of actual live video and what it's observing. You know, you're not doing things like this if you're an attacker. What you're doing is things like this. This is uh, from the Hong Kong protests where somebody has, in essence, right, a light projector over his face. So now a machine doesn't know, okay, where exactly are the eyes? Where's the nose? Where's, where's the mouth? And all the features are on, right? That's how it works in real life. That's what an, and I don't want to say an adversary in this case, because this is a pro-democracy protester in Hong Kong, um, but it's somebody actively trying to defeat a facial recognition system, right? Uh, and these are the kind of things that attackers do. And the point of these two slides is to say how we research and look at attacks against machine learning is not at all the techniques of what attackers are actually doing. So I say our adversary has tons of experience, right? You know, but we're not really studying those attacks. And I've got an example in here uh, that goes back 11 years, right? It was a 4chan related uh, attack. Uh, called operation and, and you can get the idea of profanity and what it was doing was trying to manipulate the top 10 Twitter trending topics and it was basically a, a, a somewhat inappropriate expression about gorillas 
and for a while they had taken over the trending trending topics, um, basically with social uh, social media manipula or, uh, uh, magnification and amplification. Right, enough people at 4chan got together, started posting the same hashtags, and the algorithms were quite simple. It took things over. Well, when we talk about disinformation and electoral manipulation, certainly with social media, it's doing basically the same things. Is yeah, it's a little bit more complicated now to engage in amplification, but not only are nation states, you know, from the perspective of the United States in what's going on right now with a presidential election, Russia, China, and others are trying to sit there and get their messages out to manipulate the public, but there's also political activists and parties who are doing the same thing. Right, um, is that not only of the criminals, or I shouldn't say the criminals, because that, that's not, I'm, I'm not entirely sure this is criminal behavior, but people are manipulating the algorithms, both foreign and hostile adversaries, and people within our, uh, within our own political ecosystem. And that happens everywhere to, to a much larger extent, right? It's the same thing. Um, and, you know, I said, they've been doing it for a while. And, you know, this from 2009 was, I said it was it was a bunch of people on 4chan doing relatively unsophisticated things. They're not generating adversarial samples. You know, they're just figuring out the weak points of the algorithm and kicking it over. They're not bothering with the math. So when we talk about machine learning, especially in the cybersecurity context, right? Ultimately, what comes down to is there, there's an attempt for classification, right? Now, classification generally, right? You know, what kind of class is this? Is it a cat? Is it a panda? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it, is this image represent John Bambanek or does it represent somebody else, right? Uh, that is entirely a choice of who uh, makes the system and what they're trying to accomplish. Um, and it has caused some awful bias problems. When you look at facial recognition systems, applied to um, African-American or, or people, uh, people that are black, the systems behave quite poorly, right? So you, you quite literally in a computer science context have systemic bias. Um, but like I said, those classifications are ter determined by people. They're also hard to decide, right? You can, you can have classes that are too coarse. You can have them that too narrow. Um, you know, if you have a very coarse class, it includes, it could include things that you really don't want included. If it's too narrow, you exclude things you don't want to exclude. You could create a machine learning system that doesn't just classify something as malware or benign. You could say, it's not just malware. This is NJRAT or um, AdWind or Luminosity Link, right? And those are just rats. You know, this is, this is a specific brand of stalkerware. Well, if that's your class, when somebody develops new malware, the system won't detect it. If it's too coarse, it may detect benign things. So as an example, going back to domain generation algorithms, right? Is generally a DGA produces random looking domain names of random characters, right? And it's like somebody bashed their fists on a keyboard and creating it. We know malware uses DGAs but so do ad trackers and related technologies, right? For similar reasons. Um, so the class contains both, you know, all right, maybe not malicious, uh, if you don't want to call it good, uh, and bad, right? We can agree that ransomware is better than pervasive ad and web tracking. Um, so if you're choosing a class of is a DGA or not, right? You're including data that you might not necessarily want to action, and certainly that you wouldn't want to action the same way as ransomware or botnets or so on, right? Uh, and, that, and like I said, this is a large body of cybersecurity machine learning right here where it's just kind of hand-waving. Well, we know DGAs are bad, so anything that's detected as a DGA is bad. Well, your class is a little too coarse because there is some uh, non-malicious or less malicious uses of DGAs. They're just not used by human beings. That doesn't mean the classifier doesn't give you interesting information, it does but it's not sufficient because you didn't choose your classes correctly. So, I mean, a defense for this is like a red team, right? We've discussed red, I mean, there's lots of discussions on red teams and pen testers, but there isn't really a lot of discussion in, 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 in enterprises, either both with security vendors who are creating ML tools or enterprises that have red teams that are deploying them, right? 
how do you attack this system with a hacker mindset, right? I don't, I'm not interested in people doing interesting Gaussian transforms against an ML system. What would a hacker actually do? What would a criminal do to defeat this system? And what kind of person are you hiring to figure that out, right? And I don't know that we, we've trained an awful lot of people. I don't, I don't know how many people specialize in it. Um, I've not heard of a machine learning red team per se. I know there are people thinking about it, you know, but if you're deploying machine learning, say just in fraud detection at a major financial institute, who do you have? Uh, and, and that system is, is responsible for protecting billions of dollars. Who do you have that's taking, that's kicking the tires of that thing, doing the kind of things an actual adversary would do. So vulnerability two is class confusion, right? So what if I can make something, say the National Security Agency, right? It's an intelligence agency that steals a lot of information, right? As an American, I, you know, most Americans, I guess, have a mixed view of it, but generally, right, that's the home team. Now, if I'm China or Russia, that's the adversary. Uh, but what if I can make the NSA look like Facebook, right? You know, where you can have class confusion. Well, depending on what features, that's not entirely outside the realm of possibility, right? You know, here's an example of the attributes of both. It, it, it's a crafted example, right? They both take and process lots of information. They're executing on objectives that have nothing to do necessarily with the interests of what they're surveilling, right? You know, the NSA, you know, obviously it's an intelligence agency. Uh, assassination is ultimately in the cards. Facebook, hopefully not, but they both, behave similar to intelligence agencies, but you would, you would treat them differently, right? Uh, depending on how you would define that class. But thinking about it, it's, it's, it's an absurd example. You shouldn't treat Facebook the same way you treat an intelligence agency. But if you're creating your classes coarsely enough, both would be, uh, both would be captured. But it's interesting, right? If you just take a look at, let's define a class of malicious software. We'd all agree ransomware should be on it. Ransomware is awful, right? There's, there's talks about, uh, about this at this conference. It's still a problem, uh, you know, going on seven years now, um, going back to CryptoLocker in 2013, which is kind of the first modern successful form of ransomware. It's still with us. Stalkerware. We can all agree that domestic abuse is horrible and software that enables domestic abuse is horrible, right? Well, what about potentially unwanted uh, applications? Well, you know, as an IT administrator, you might not want it, uh, but maybe your policies don't prohibit it, right? It's certainly different than ransomware. What about crypto miners, right? A lot of antivirus is very strong at detecting things mining Monero, but that also means people who are hobbyists who want to mine Monero at home, all of a sudden have difficulty either, and in, in, in if the antivirus doesn't allow them to create exceptions, either they've got to decide not to run antivirus or not to mine Monero. You know, there's the individual, you know, uh, that has all of those, I don't, I don't know how, how this happens uh, or if this still happens anymore, but back in the day when I did IT support, there was always somebody who had like six, seven different toolbars in Internet Explorer, you know, to provide, you know, information or ads and, um, you know, oh, they'd see an ad every now and then and they get two cents for clicking it or whatever, right? Um, as an IT administrator, I didn't, I didn't hate it. Or I did. I didn't. I you know. I didn't treat it as ransomware, but the policy at the place didn't allow me to do anything about it except saying, "Hey, by the way, this stuff is kind of spying on you. You might not want to think about not using it anymore." So defenses to that: don't do unsupervised machine learning and don't use products that do it. Right? If you're doing kind of research to go find new and interesting things, your your hunt team to try to see if you can get insights. Generally, okay. You can do unsupervised machine learning, but in the cybersecurity context, right? You want to you want to provide known, classed, uh, and labeled data uh, to the system uh, because, again, you have the class confusion problem, right? If I'm just doing uh, unsupervised machine learning on domain names, yeah, I'm going to get all this algorithmically generated domains clustered over here. Well, there's some good and bad in there. That doesn't give me anything to act on, or I should say, if I act on it. I'm going to be making mistakes. Uh, so spend real time on figuring what the classifications are and labeling them and defining that of what's included and what's not. 
with, with like I said, trying to balance the being too coarse, being brain too narrow. But also bear in mind, the attackers know, kind of know our classes. Everything we do is public uh, in essence. Uh, so they're able to uh, determine that and act accordingly. As a, um, you'll hear uh, vendors say it, but our machine learning models are proprietary. The attackers don't have them. In adversarial machine learning, there's a concept of what's called transferability, namely that if you have models that are roughly, and, and I emphasize rough, similar in terms of the kind of features they use and the kind of data they use, attacks against one are valid against all of them. The percentages might change a little bit, but by and large, if I can take a white paper a vendor does and kind of infer, okay, this is the features that they're using and the attributes, and here's the data sets that they're using, I can simply just create my own model with my own data that's roughly similar and then keep attacking that until I'm successful and then deploy that attack and I will probably be successful in defeating uh, that proprietary model. This is what I call the virus total problem. Right, is if I want to see if my piece of malware is detected, I simply could submit it to virus total and it runs against all the AV engines. Uh, I could buy the AV tools or the endpoint tools and run my attacks against it. If I'm an intelligence agency, I, I have a budget to do exactly that. If I'm an attacker, I've got to do more tra uh, 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 crafted things. But the point is the attacker can test attacks as much as they want until they get it right. Or for that matter, um, and, and what we see particularly with phishing is they simply just keep attacking in production because they don't need every attack to work. They just need one to get through, right? They need to get lucky once. We need to get lucky every single time, right? But not every attack is the same, right? Which means, like I said, they can experiment. And if the models are done too narrowly, things will slip through because it's new and doesn't match any of the previous labels, right? So the model should be ambiguous. And what does that mean, right? Is in data science, you want your models typically to make a decision. I wanna run machine learning and I wanna have an answer. A lot of times, a lot of the data, it's very certain, it's very obvious, right? And, if, and, and those of you who are, who are SOC analysts, there's lots of things that you could look at and make a determination in seconds and you know you're right. And then there's some that takes some time and work. The same is uh, true by analogy in machine learning. The data that's not clear cut is what's interesting to you, right? We talk about hunt teams. We know, we know that uh, in threat intelligence and, and SOC teams is there's people out there looking for failures. What's the analogy in data science, right? There should be people looking, whether it's a van vendor deploying these tools or an enterprise who's using machine learning tools to figure stuff out is, I wanna figure out where, you know, where's the model, what data and results is the model only 60% confident of? Maybe that's what I should be taking a look at because you never want to take the humans out of the mix. Because like I said, there's human error uh, that's already caked into these models. Um, so you, you don't have to analyze every decision a machine learning model makes, but certainly you could do 10% you know, manually uh, when a model is new and then 1% going forward. If something makes a decision, you know, one out of 100 times, send it to a SOC anyway to say, hey, take a look at this, Give it a thumbs up or thumbs down about whether it's correct or not. But like I said, also have a machine learning hunt team look at the ambiguous results because that's where the interesting data lives. That's where your APT is going to be, right? That's where your targeted attacks are going to be more often than not. There's a couple of things that make it look bad, but they're really trying to make it look good, right? Uh, there's lots of stuff that's just going to be the noise. Uh, the internet background radiation. And block it by all means. If you can get that off of your SOC's desk, great. You, you've got a big win. But focus on that interesting data and don't fo force a model uh, to make a decision for you. And the last point, right, is, is many of your enterprises and a lot of people are saying, hey, you know, this machine learning this and machine learning that, you know, and it's a buzzword. Some people are saying machine learning and it's not really doing any real machine learning. But you can ask vendors, right, and your partners, all right, exactly what are you doing, right? You know, where did you curate your training data, right? How, did, when, how often do you update it? Uh, you know, how do you define your classes? Are you doing unsupervised versus supervised learning, right? 
And some people say, hey, these algorithms and, and data science, and they'll try to dazzle you with, with math. And, and that's not the interesting questions. That's not really the important questions. It's where you got your data. How are you curating it? How are you labeling it and classifying it? How are you defining the classes? Are you doing supervised versus unsupervised? And are you analyzing results? Are you getting telemetry back to sit there for somebody to evaluate saying, hey, we got this wrong and we need to go tweak our models and, re and, and relearn it? Right? Somebody's saying, but the algorithms is not a good answer because, like I said, the human error isn't in the linear algebra. The human error is in all the, hum the human decisions that go into what gets thrown through the linear algebra, right? Uh, and a last point, right? ML can classify and, and do a fairly decent job if you can control all of the above. Uh, there are a lot of people trying to, to, to do machine learning to protect outcomes, right? And that's not just in cybersecurity, right? There's lots of other UK use cases with insurance companies and, and education and, and on and on. Uh, machine learning does not fare well there. Right. So if somebody's peddling, you know, machine learning to, to predict outcomes, you know, not even the research and the math shows that that is that is truly a, uh, a viable way to apply this technology. I think we've got about three and a half minutes left for questions. Uh, thank you for attending my session. If you have any questions, uh, there's an uh, email there uh, I'm available on Twitter as well. Uh, and I will. Uh, give some time here now for your questions uh, before the next speaker comes up. Thank you very much, John. That was really, really interesting. I'm sure um, it was uh, quite, quite interesting to kind of leverage your, your PhD studies in, the, in, in this field as well, right? So mm -hmm. it's really, really good when you can do that. Uh, two birds, one stone and all that. Um, yep. well, yeah. um, so I did have a question for you. So there was a presentation earlier uh, from Australia's e-safety commissioner, mm -hmm. and she was asked whether or not the technology companies were doing enough for safety or, or whether it's a, a problem that's a little bit too hard to solve. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, do you feel as though a lot of the tech companies are using machine learning uh, in the appropriate ways to kind of potentially limit the the threat to democracy or the threat to kind of these types of things that we have seen, you know, potentially in the 2016 elections, you know, in, 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 in your neck of the woods in the US? Um, I, every time, you know, most days I go to twi Twitter and I look at tw trending topics. And I mean, I don't know who's manipulating it, but I know it's manipulated, right? Um, you know, I, so you dig into amplification networks. It's, it's, you know, with, with SEO and social media, we are really nowhere. I, I, maybe that's too cynical, uh, but I'm Irish by heritage and everything kind of sucks. So um, uh, we're not very far along in trying to uh, curate out manipulated online content, you know, and, and whether that's phishing emails or phishing web pages or uh, manipulated search results or any of that. I mean, it's, it's a cat and mouse game. Nobody has solved that. They're trying, but I don't know that it's a, a terribly solvable problem uh, based on the techniques and what we're trying to do today. Um, so yeah, we're still seeing manipulated content. The difference between 2016 and 2020 uh, from the United States perspective and foreign adversaries is that Russia was predominantly the one trying to influence in 2016. Now there's several other countries doing it as well and they have divergent incentives so I don't know if it's canceled out, right? Russia wants to have Trump win, China wants Biden to win. They're both relatively sophisticated as their influence canceling each other out. Yeah, that's really it's not like a, two, two big really, waves yeah, kind, of, kind, of, kind of hit each other. Kind of, uh, geopolitical fourth dimensional cast, not technology. <laughs> uh, and we've got about 40 seconds left. So there is one question in the Q&A tab. Um, mm -hmm. Is there any categories slash use cases where you find machine learning to be better or more reliable than others? Um, like I said, I mean, it, it really, it depends on the, on, on the data that you start with. I mean, natural language processing is, is pretty good depending on what you're doing with it, right? Um, I've got an Amazon Echo behind me. I can give it instructions and it's fairly accurate. Uh, but we've all kind of seen the voice recognition failures. Um, in cybersecurity, it's very difficult because we don't have a lot of good curated data sets, right? Could I model benign 
uh, endpoint behavior. Sure. Uh, if there's an enterprise out there in the audience who is willing to let me run an agent on all of their endpoints, and I'll anonymize the data to create a, a, a good uh, data set of benign workstation behavior, I'm more than happy to do it. But your counsel would say no, because it's a huge privacy and confidentiality risk. Well, thank you very much for the great presentation. And if there are any other questions from any of the members of the audience, please do please do reach out to John. His contact details are on the slide just there. Thanks again. Mm -hmm. um, enjoy your evening, and hopefully you can you can stick around and see some presentations and before it becomes too late <laughs> in your time. And thanks again, and take care. Thank you. You too.